Uh, yeah. Uh, don't want to burn my leg again. I literally did that a minute ago. <laughs> um, yeah, it's another kitchen tutorial because uh, evidently I can't get enough of them. Uh, for those of you who are new to this channel, uh, this isn't going to be a traditional tutorial where every single step uh, is is explained because then it's too long and also I'm insulting your intelligence because most of it's basic. So this is just going to be like the broad workflow and then along the way going in uh, deeper on a few of the tips and tricks that I learned uh, while I was making it. Um, like how I halved the render times twice. Um, adding dirt into the crevices of things very easily using a new node in Blender and uh, oh adding trees without increasing your render times. Um, so let's not waste any time, let's get straight into it. So the idea for the scene came when I was browsing Pinterest one day and then I came across this photo. Um, and what I liked about it most was that it didn't have a lot of furniture because as anyone who's done interiors knows, furniture is very time consuming. So I was like, hey, those shapes look very basic. I could do that. So uh, yeah, I went about recreating it. So you could do it like eyeballing it, but I wanted to do it like one to one, you know, matching on top of each other. Um, so to do that, first thing you have to do is also one of the most boring, um, but it's the most important. And that's making sure that your 3D camera matches the camera that the photo was taken with because otherwise you'll start modeling things and nothing will line up. So um, in previous videos, I've always used an add-on called Blam, um, but there's been a new development. Uh, the guy who made that add-on has since broken it off into its own standalone open source software called FSpy. And uh, it's awesome. I have to tell you, it's way easy to use. Uh, basically, you drag in the image and then you've got the axes lines and you can drag them and adjust them. And then when you're finished, you hit save and then there is an add-on for Blender, which will basically read that file. And then in one click, you've got everything set up. The camera's pointing the right way. You've got the image plane added. You can even set the scale of it so that it matches the right scale as well. Um, it's really awesome. And because it's standalone, you can also use it for other software as well, like After Effects or Maya, because all the camera settings are there. It's Honestly, it's awesome software. Um, but anyway, if you extrude out the floor, um, you should see that it matches the, the floor in the photo. Extrude it up, it should match the ceiling. And then once you've got those two things, basically you can just start modeling and blocking out the rest of the scene. So uh, then you've got to add in some light and to have light, you've got to have windows. Now, here's a fun fact about me. I hate modeling windows. They suck. They are the most annoying thing to model because there's a track, there's the frame of the window, there's the, 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 the window pane, there's the sill, there's so many little intricacies and they've all got to line up. I hate it. So whenever possible, I use an add-on. Um, and I only just discovered this, but there's an awesome one that comes with Blender called Archipack. Um, so basically you enable it. Um, it's in Blender 2.8 as well, which is really handy. Uh, you click on window, you select the type of window, and then it adds in a window with like a rig so that you can like drag the window to the, the right size that you want it. And uh, yeah, it's really awesome. Uh, the only thing it doesn't do yet is create the right materials um, for cycles, but I believe that's gonna be added soon. Really the, the most important one is the glass itself. Um, because as I mentioned in the last video, if you just set that to a glass shader and then you have light going through a glass pane, um, what you're gonna be creating without knowing is a noise trap. The whole interior is gonna be filled with noise and you won't know why. The reason it's happening is that uh, it's trying to calculate caustics and shadow from that glass into the interior. Even though it's such a negligible change that there's no point in doing it, it's still trying to do that. So what you wanna do is use this node setup. It looks complicated, but it's really not. <laughs> All it's saying is, uh, Everywhere in the scene, imagine that the glass is transparent. There's nothing there. But to the camera, render it as if it is actually glass. Um, and that's it. So then you can just use that on the windows and the light will go through it. Um, so for the lighting, um, I actually discovered this like right at the end of the scene. You might know that I am a, a big uh, supporter of using HDR lightings 
for everything, right? Um, whatever you're going to use, like use HDRs, right? Because you get better lighting, you get free reflections. It's awesome. But I discovered that using an HDR can sometimes double your render times. So if I just use a flat world color to light this, this interior here, it rendered in about one minute, 30 seconds. But then when I used an HDR, it was three minutes, 10, uh, which is crazy to me. I don't know how I didn't discover this earlier, uh, but it's, it's absolutely crazy. So, I mean, the lighting that's coming in here is just like flat, you know, pretty uniform looking lighting. So I'm not getting anything extra really for all that render time. If it was an exterior scene, I still think using an HDR helps and you probably wouldn't even have this problem because there's not all the light bounces and stuff. Um, but for interiors, I really don't think anyone should be using HDRs anymore. Um, so I just used a flat, like light blue color to simulate a morning scene. I decided instead of it just being like clear white, like the reference, I was going to go morning. Um, and uh, that was it for the lighting. Um, and speaking of render times, here's a pro tip. While you're still building your scene, I find it helpful to drop the uh, maximum light bounces to one um, because it will typically cut your render times in half. And uh, it makes moving around and previewing things a lot faster. And then when you want to do your final render, just increase it up to two, probably tops, um, or like three if you wanted to go like ultra realistic or whatever. It doesn't really make that much of a difference, but anyway. Um, then it comes time to the materials. So obviously I used a bunch of polygon materials, obviously. Uh, so I used uh, this Scandinavian wood flooring material um, that fit pretty well for the floor. Um, and then for the counter, even though there's not one in the reference photo, I thought it would be cool to, I don't know, I was just messing around and I added in a marble material and I thought it looked kind of cool. So I had it as this sort of like overflow through thing going down the counter and it looked nice. Uh, then for the exterior, there's like, there's nothing in the photo to see, but I added in a step there, like a sort of a, a piece of concrete. I used this side walk material. Um, and then as a tip, uh, if you spend any time outdoors, which for us Blunder users is probably an inconvenience, uh, you'd know that uh, where, where exterior surfaces meet like that, uh, you typically get like dirt buildup in the crevices of things. So for this step here, I wanted to have like some brown sort of grunge, um, sort of where dirt and, you know, after rain and things, it would sort of collect in that area. Now, previously in Blender, this was a pain to add. You had to like do texture painting and it was just, it was annoying. Well, now there's an easy way. In Blender 2.8, there is an ambient occlusion node. Previously there was one in Blender, but it was a separate shader and it was annoying to use. The ambient occlusion node is much easier. You add it in and then what you want to do is you want to mix that with your your texture with your, your, you know, in this case, this sidewalk texture. So you add in a mix RGB node and then take the color like of your texture and just put that into the bottom input. And then the ambient occlusion output, you want to use that as the factor input because this is going to drive a new color into your color texture. So that, that, that little texture there, that untapped color, that is going to be the color. So you can set that to like a brownie sludge color. Then if you add in a color ramp node between those two, then you can determine where that AO um, actually appears in it. Um, so it's a little fiddly to set up at first, but then it gives you a lot of control over where that actually appears. Um, and it's really easy. Like it's it just creates this nice little brown sort of dirt buildup. It's, it's, it's subtle, but it just made the step looks less, you know, like stark, bright, colorful white when you know, it's outdoors, you would see a little bit of dirt. So um, that was pretty handy. Then for the rest of the exterior, right? So you've got to have something outside your windows, obviously, because otherwise it's just going to look stark and boring. So uh, I used this tree, which I bought off CD Trader. There's like 12 of them in this pack or whatever. It's this pine tree thing. Trouble is, is this is really taxing on a render. Anytime you've got any sort of realistic tree, it's super taxing on the computer. And uh, I, I, I hated it. So what I d discovered was if you actually just render uh, the tree, like just as a single image, and then I did another one of like, I, I put them as a particle setting and then I just rendered like a tree line. Then I used that as just a, on a flat image plane. Um, I got the same look because the lighting matched the scene, obviously. Um, and, uh, and there was like almost no, obviously, uh, difference to the render times. So I would highly recommend that if you're, if you need to add trees to an architectural image, be like, oh, it's going to kill my render times. Just like move the camera there, just render one thing. You 
use it as an image plane and you'll just save so much in render times. Um, so that was really handy. Um, then for the, going back inside, uh, models, right? So a kitchen, a dining table, if you had to model all the little utensils and things like that, you would just spend weeks on it, which is why every architectural studio in the world uses model libraries. So uh, we recently added one at Polygon. Uh, so we added uh, you know, a bunch of utensils and food stuff. So I just used those in the scene, like this espresso maker, like a jar of utensils, um, a, a knife block. I put a croissant, croissant? Uh, on, the, on the countertop there, ah, the French, uh, the uh, uh, coffee cup, uh, you know, just little things like that, just to try and make it look good. I also used this chair that I found on CG Trader right in the background there. Did not model that myself, no credit for that at all, um, but it, it looked okay. Um, and that, I mean, basically you just gotta fill it in until it looks good. Like it's, yeah, it's time consuming and it's a little bit of artistic control as well. You'll add something in, then you go, that doesn't look right. It sort of changes the mood of it. Like I had wine glasses on the table at first and then I'm like, why would you have wine in the morning? Unless you're an alcoholic, obviously. Um, so I remove that. You know, it's a bit of a, a bit of an artistic process, but it's uh, it's a bit of fun. Uh, I did model the bar stools, which are easy. It's just a cube for the leg, extruded up, then spin tool to make it curved. You mirror it, and you got a chair. Pretty easy. Um, and I also made the paintings because, uh, by pure coincidence, I was at a furniture store and I was sitting on this chair, and then I looked over and I saw these paintings, these abstract, weird shapes, and I thought that will look kind of cool in my scene. So I went back home and then in Photoshop, I just drew out these basic shapes and subtracted things. And I put this like ink splotch effect over it. Um, and then I put it on the wall and I thought it looked pretty cool. Um, and then finally, uh, compositionally, like the scene looks good, but I wanted uh, more attention drawn to the countertops. So I wanted to put some down lights, like, you know, it's early morning, somebody's made a croissant and a coffee and the down lights are on over the countertop. So there's a new feature in Blender 2.8 called IES Lighting, uh, which if you don't know what that is, it's a, it's a file, an IES file, um, which the manufacturer typically provides for a specific light and it creates the exact throw pattern of the actual light in real life. Um, and so it allows you to get like interesting like light shapes over it than what you would normally get with just a standard light. Um, anyway, so all you do is you add a point lamp and then you go to the node setup and then you add an IES texture, click external, and then you wanna drop in a file, an IES file. There's a bunch of free ones online. I found this one, I'll put the link in the description. Um, I just used a file, put it in there, and then you get this downlight effect. Very subtle, like it looks pretty similar to a spot lamp, but it's slightly different. And I found like comparing you know, spot lamp to that, like it does create a very subtle effect of just making the, the room feel a little bit more real. Um, and then I also used a black body temperature for the color input of that lamp. Black body temperature is like, actually, what is it? It's like the Kelvin measurement system for light bulbs. Um, so basically the lower the value, the more warmer it is, like down to like a candle flame. And then the higher it is, um, the more whiter it becomes. So I set it to around about 4,500, got a slightly warm, but also whitish looking light. And then finally, it was time to render it. So I rendered it at 3,500 samples, which probably still wasn't enough. And the best I could get it down to was 12 minutes and 24 seconds seconds um, on my two GTX 1080 Ti's. So that's a really, really long render time. And uh, that's the best I could do. After all these optimizations, that's the best I could do. I tried portals, it made no difference. I tried sun lamps instead of environment lamps, made no difference. I dropped the light paths. I, I think I used two for the whole thing. Yes, I used two, um, but that was the best I could get. Um, now, I was gonna use the denoiser, and I think I did for a couple of shots in the animation, but the problem with the denoiser is that you get glitches. Like as the camera moves, typically as one object passes behind another or something like that, it sort of like gets these little stuttery things, which I think I've mentioned in a previous video. So instead, I just, I didn't use any denoiser, but then when I got the rendered frame, um, I uh, put it into Premiere and then I used the Neat Video plugin, which people on Twitter said to me is still one of the best ways to get rid of noise. But what I like is you get control over it. You don't have to have it baked into the frame and then you have like you have to go back and re-render it if you wanted to change it. So I do like that. Um, and then that was it. So that is the animation. That's how I did it. The whole workflow. Um, I'm hoping some of these tips helped you out. If it did, give 
give it a thumbs up to help other people like it. And uh, you can click any of the other videos on the screen here and watch some of my other tutorials slash making ofs. Um, and that's it, guys. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.